I want you to pray for me this morning. I want to share from the Word of God with you. The Lord gave me this a few nights back. I don't know if it was a dream or the Lord just woke me up and this was on my heart, but I want to talk to us today about the importance of a divine revelation. A divine revelation. You now think about the scripture that tells us without a vision, people perish. How many has a vision of the church of God? I'm talking about not just something that you've been taught all your life, your grandparents lived it, your parents lived it, and you just sort of found yourself in it. But I'm talking about a vision, a spiritual enlightenment, something that comes from no one but God. If you will, look with me in Matthew 16. I want to read this beginning in verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? This is what the Lord laid on my heart. This particular scripture. Whom do men say that I am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. A very powerful passage of Scripture that we have all heard throughout our lives. But I want to try to expound on it a little bit this morning to bring us even further into what took place here. Caesarea Philippi. It was a Roman city built at the base of Mount Hermon. And it was, some, some say, between 30 and 40 miles from the Sea of Galilee. Anybody ever been there? Between 30 and 40 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, it was about a 12-hour hike on foot up a mountainous terrain to the base of Mount Hermon. Caesarea Philippi was a very worldly place. It was a very demonic place. When you came into uh, sight of the mountain, it was a huge mountain, a great mass of rock and stone that was very intimidating, very uh, large. It was a high place, the Bible says. But as you came into sight, 
there were niches that were cut out into that mountain. And in those niches set statues of pagan gods. You praying for me this morning? We're, we're just trying to build. We're, we'll get there in a minute. But high up on that mountain, yes. these statues of pagan gods, Pan, the, he was half man and half goat. And these, Baal was worshipped there and others. But you saw as you, as you entered into the region there, as you, before you got there, you could see this mountain, this huge mountain. And all of these pagan gods... It was a, a place pretty much off limits to the Jews because there was such a worldly actions, vain actions, vile actions that went on there and worshiping of these idols and these pagan gods. And there was a great marble temple that was built there and to the base of that mountain. And within these temples, there were caves that went down into the mountain. And these caves led down into pools of water down deep in these mountains. And there were where the worship in this temple of these pagan gods, there were human sacrifices made here in these caves. It was a very demonic place. But Jesus saw fit to carry His disciples there. A 12-hour journey by foot. As they came into this region of Caesarea, Philippi. Jesus took His disciples there for a purpose. To reveal some things to them and to ask them some questions. But when He came into this place and all of this came in sight, I can imagine they probably didn't get too close. But they stood back and Jesus, with all his disciples, maybe some of them even being the first time that they had went that far to this place. But as they were there, Jesus looked at them and said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? <laughs> here the Son of God stood. <laughs> And here in sight of the church, the disciples here, they were eyewitness to all of this pagan worship. Very intimidating, probably, to only 12 people. But everyone worshiping whoever they wanted to worship. Making gods. But he said unto them, Who do men say that I am? <laughs> The disciples began to speak back to him, and they said, well, some, some say you're, you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And you know, Brother Jason, although this was actually meant to be compliments, some good opinions, they were false. <laughs> They were not accurate in defining, identifying who Christ was. Although, it, you know, some may have thought, well, it's pretty, you know, complimentary to be considered you possibly could be John the Baptist. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Jesus led them there to show them there's all kind of worship of other gods going on here. He said, who, who do men say that I am? Do they compare me to these? Well, maybe you're John the Baptist. Maybe you're Jeremiah. Maybe you're Elijah. You know, all of this was false. 
If you do not know, without a shadow of a doubt, who Christ is, then there's no sense in trying to compliment Him by comparing Him to somebody else. <laughs> oh, they were just as wrong as all of this multitude of people that flocked there to worship these idol gods. They were just as wrong. He was not Jeremiah. He was not Elijah. He was not any of the prophets. But then he looked at the disciples and he said, Whom say ye that I am? You better have an understanding. You better have an understanding of who Christ is. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. It doesn't matter, although they may have some good ideas, some good opinions, some high opinions, it was not high enough. It was not good enough. Why? Because it was false. False opinions are built on mistakes after mistakes after mistakes. Jesus was trying to reveal something to them there. He said, whom say ye that I am? Peter immediately spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ. <laughs> the Christ. The Son of the living God. Oh, when he said this, joy bubbled up in Christ. I can see him leaping for joy. He said, Blessed art thou. <laughs> Blessed art thou, Simon. <laughs> He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You know where flesh and blood ideas will get you? Jesus took them on a 12-hour hike up a mountain to show them. All of this right here that you're witnessing, all of this is men's ideas. But he said, blessed art thou, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. But my Father, which is in heaven, <laughs> I'm talking about a divine revelation, something that comes from no one, David, but God Almighty into your heart, into your understanding. Uh, you better not place your opinions on what nobody says of Christ and His church. You better have a divine revelation. Opinions will get you on the wrong track. He said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this. Blessed art thou. <laughs> you're blessed this morning. If you know about Christ and His church, you're blessed. You're blessed. Why? Because if you have received a divine revelation. I asked how many had a vision of the church. How many has received a divine revelation? A lot of people in the church does not have a divine revelation of the church. They are basing their walk with Christ and their membership off of things that they have been taught and handed down from generation to generation. But Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon. Blessed art thou. Peter Confessed. This is known as Peter's great confession. He confessed immediately of the exclusiveness of the Son of God and His church. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon. Huh? Not your own intellect has revealed this to you. Not, your, not information from others. Not even nature. Nature does not reveal to anybody Christ and His church. Nature will reveal God to you, the great Creator. The Bible says men are without excuse. Why? Because nature, even nature reveals this. It will show you there is a God in heaven. You know the only way you can have an understanding, a revelation of Christ and the church of God, it is a divine revelation that comes only from God the Father in heaven uh, through the Spirit. 
into your heart, into your understanding. A divine revelation. When God Almighty gets a hold of the curtain and pulls it back. Things that's been hidden. Intellect cannot reveal unto you. But God, a divine hand, reaches and He pulls back the curtain and shows it unto you. That's the only way to receive a revelation of Christ in His church. A divine revelation will not bring confusion. There will be no ifs and and buts. You ever heard that little phrase? I've heard it all my life. No if and no if and or buts. The divine revelation of God won't leave you confused. It won't give you no doubts, no questions. Peter said, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." There was no question about it. No double-mindedness. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But a divine revelation, a spirit that comes from God, will not cause confusion about Christ or the church of God. But you will be established. You will be stable. You will be sure. You will be true. You will be firm. You will be solid in your vision of the church. My children must have their own revelation. I've given them all that I could ever possibly afford to give them in this life. I've given them love. I've given them shelter. I've given them food. I've went out beyond my abilities to try to give them love. I cannot give them a divine revelation of the church of God. They must receive it from God Almighty. Brother Chris talked up here this morning about him and Wendy, their relationship. I think you preached it the other night about mine and your relationship. We share a lot. We share, we're, we're one in the eyes of God. She's got to have her own revelation of the church, of Christ, who Christ is and His church. She cannot get that from me. I cannot give it to her. I cannot receive it from her. It must come from God Almighty. Verse 18 said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Here is the fulfillment. When Christ first met Simon, Andrew introduced him to Christ. He said, This is Simon, my brother. He said, Thou shalt be called Cephas. You're going to be called (laughs) Cephas, which meant rock. But here, Jesus says, I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter. (laughs) Thou art Peter. Thou art the rock. (laughs) There was something fulfilled here in Peter's great confession of who Christ was. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Here they stood at the, at the base of Mount Hermon and they seen this great mass of rock and this, all of these gods, false gods, statues up on this rock looking down upon them. Uh, I can see Jesus turning His back on it. I can see Him turning His back on all of that pagan worship. Uh, they, t- they took the disciples up there to show them how foolish all of that was. He said, you received a divine revelation from God Almighty, from my Father, give it to you. He said, upon this rock, not all of this, but upon this rock, I will build my church uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, Oh, they had titled these entrance ways down into this mountain. They had titled that gates of hell. Why? 
Because they believed these pagan gods. This was their entrance and exit from this world to the underworld. They believed this is where they came and exited from. They even made human sacrifices there. And they said, this is the gate of hell. Jesus said, the gates of hell <laughs> will not prevail against my church. <laughs> Why? Because it's built on something that God Almighty has put into your heart. A divine revelation. Huh? How important is your revelation today? I say it's very important. It shall not prevail against it. It shall not withstand. It shall not prevent the power of the church of God. The force of the church of God. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Uh -uh. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but listen to this, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Uh Uh-huh. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Why? Because of the hand of God moving the church of God. She's being compared to a runaway locomotive. Huh? My old pastor, Brother Anders, there in Riesel, he used to preach many times, get in, get out, or get run over. That was one of his favorite sayings. Get in, get out, or get run over. Why? The church of God is moving. Huh? The church of God is moving. You need a divine revelation of who she is. <laughs> the gates of hell are not going to prevail against her, against Christ and the church. Look with me in John chapter 6. Another place. Now listen to this. Another place of Peter's confession. Some say this is Peter's second confession. But Jesus preaching to the multitude here said, I am the bread of life. I want to show you here why a divine revelation is important. Why it is essential to you. Why you cannot make it off of flesh and blood opinions and ideas of men. Listen to what Jesus was preaching. He said, I am the bread of life. He went on to say, except ye eat my flesh and drink my blood, ye have no life in you. Huh? We've all heard that, hadn't we? We all know what happens next. Some of them said, Now, this was some of the disciples that were following him. Some said, this is a hard saying. Hey, I got news for you. Everybody listen. If you stick around the church of God, you're going to hear some hard sayings. You're going to hear some hard teachings. You're going to hear some hard advice. (laughs) Huh? Jesus said, lest you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there you have no life in you. Some of these who were following Christ, they said, well, wait, wait a minute. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who, who wants to hear that kind of preaching? <laughs> you ever heard somebody say that? Who wants to hear that? Who, who, who? Well, if it's in the Word, we need to hear it. The Bible says, from that time, many went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because of hard sayings. They had no vision. They were following because of their own ideas and own opinions. 
But listen, Jesus turned to the twelve. Well, let's read it. Verse 67, John chapter 6, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? You know you got some decisions to make. Amen. Just as Simon, the day he took them all up, Simon spoke for all of them, but they were all in agreement. But just as, as Jesus took them all up to Caesarea Philippi that day, and then he asked some questions. You're going to be faced with some questions. You're going to be faced with some decisions. You need the Spirit of God to make these decisions. You are not qualified to make them on your own. You'll make mistakes. But Jesus said, will ye also go away? Now listen to this. Simon Peter, once again, speaking up, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? <laughs> to whom shall we go? Here, once again, realizing and confessing, there's only one. All those pagan gods that they walked up that mountain that day and looked up and seen all, they knew there ain't but one Son of God. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Oh, that's a beautiful passage of Scripture, ain't it? Where, where else can we go? Thou hast the words. But listen to what else. Most of the time we stop that story right there. Listen to what else. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Let's read it again. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> huh? Where else can we go? You're the only one. <laughs> there is no other. you got the words of eternal life. But let me tell you something else. We know, we believe, we are sure you are the Son of God. Uh, I'm talking about a divine revelation. When, when they witnessed all of these others that said, I'm not following that hullabaloo. That's too hard of a saying. And they witnessed them walk away. It took something for them to watch all the, some of their friends, some of their families walk away. It took something from them to say, uh, He's the Christ. <laughs> I know, I believe, I'm sure He is the Son of God. We better have a divine revelation not being affected by those close around us. Uh, how important is your vision of the church? Those who went back represent shallowness. Huh? Instability. No foundation. No divine revelation. No vision. Shallowness without any foundation to them. They said, huh, we're not going to take this. We'll, we'll go another way. It represents shallowness. I thought of the man who built his house upon the earth. Hmm? And the stream beat vehemently against it. And the Bible says immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Why? Because there was no foundation. He just went out here on top of the earth, scratched back a little grass, maybe... Chalked him off of what he wanted to build and, and built it. We was back a few years back in Canton, North Carolina. Uh, I believe it was Hurricane Ivan uh, and Floyd. I can't remember. It was two that came through there, one right behind the other. And just devastated Haywood County over here in the mountains of North Carolina. But down there close in town at a park, there were some old houses. And we saw one house where the water just picked it up and moved it across the yard next door to its neighbor and just slammed it right up against their house. Why? There wasn't no foundation. There, there was no foundation there. 
the stream came and it just slammed it right against the next door to their neighbor. Same water, same street, wouldn't but a few feet between them. That house stood. <laughs> Why? It was built on a solid foundation. <laughs> Listen to this now. Listen to this. But he which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. <laughs> when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. <laughs> uh, the rock is important. <laughs> the rock is important. The foundation is important. Christ and the church of God and a vision of it is important to you. Without it, you're not going to make it. Why? Because the storm's coming, Jason. People down in North Carolina, down at the coast, they were warned for days. The biggest storm we've ever seen is coming. Huh? And it came. Some took off running. Some stayed. But anything they did did not prevent the storm from coming. The storm came. Now, the some made preparation for it. Wise. Some were led. My aunt down there, the storm wasn't supposed to hit till Thursday night. She left Monday morning. She got out. Now the interstates are shut down down there. Highway 40, Highway 95, you can't even travel it. It's underwater. The storm is coming. <laughs> Your foundation is very important. <laughs> where you stand, where you build is very important. The rock is important. Huh? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 and 20 that the church is built upon the foundations of the apostles. <laughs> And prophets, that's what it says. It's built upon the apostles, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What else does it say? Jesus Christ uh, himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, that's what the church of God is built on. Uh, that divine revelation, Jesus Christ being the rock. He, he looked at his disciples that day and said, what you see up here ain't no rock. <laughs> that great mountain, that wasn't no rock. He said, I'm going to build my church upon the rock. He was the rock. But it took something else to establish his church. Christ, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me finish this. Jesus spoke, well, Let's back up. 1 Corinthians 3 and 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. This foundation, this same foundation, this divine revelation yes. was essential for the apostles. Huh? It was essential for them in the establishment of the church of God. Yes, it was. It is essential for you and I today to continue on on the same foundation. Jesus said, upon this rock, I believe that he turned his back on Caesarea Philippi and all of that demonic spirit and pagan worship. And he said, I will build my church. Upon this rock. He was the rock. We must understand. He is the rock. But it took something else. For Jesus to establish his church. He can't. Or he, he wouldn't have desired. To have a church. And him be the only part of it. He was the rock. Listen to this. Jesus spoke of the stone that the builders had rejected. <laughs> he was the stone. <laughs> he spoke of a stone that the builders had rejected. 
Uh, what did, why? Because they had no vision. They had no divine revelation. He's talking about the Jews. He's talking about Israel. And he spoke about there was a stone that the builders rejected. Huh? <laughs> the same has become the head of the corner. <laughs> huh? Israel rejected Christ, His own people. But that did not change anything. He was still the stone. Isaiah 28 and 16, God said, Behold, I lay in Zion. Amen, in Zion. <laughs> I lay, I lay in Zion. What did He lay? For a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone cornerstone, a sure foundation. <laughs> Jesus was the stone. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. But he jumped for joy when, he, when Peter said, thou art the, son, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed art thou. Finally, blessed art thou, Simon. There was another stone. It was a divine revelation. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus said, Upon this rock, I am the rock, and this divine revelation that you have, I can't establish my church. <laughs> That's what he was longing for. Someone who had a divine revelation. Huh. Your vision of the church is important. Your divine revelation is important. Is it essential to have a divine revelation? A personal revelation of Christ in His church. Turn with me in 2 Thessalonians. This is my last scripture. Chapter 2. Paul warns. Why is your revelation today? Jesus established the church 2,000 years ago. Huh? She has arose out of darkness in 1903. She's compared to a runaway locomotive today. She's on the way. She's right on schedule. She's right on target. Amen. Why is a divine revelation so important today? I took the covenant many years ago. I'm a member of the church of God. Paul warns about something in these last days. Let's read it. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away. First, this is why your revelation, your vision is so important. There's coming a falling away. There's not just coming a falling away. We're in the midst of a falling away. Huh? And that man of sin be revealed, the son of prediction, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that I, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Paul is telling, warning us of the coming of the Lord. I preached on it the last two Sundays. Here in his writings, he talks about the Antichrist. Huh? The Antichrist is not going to set itself up until after the church is raptured. 
I'm talking about the true Antichrist that will move into the temple and set himself up as God. This will take place after the rapture. But Paul warns about something that's going to take place before the rapture. A great falling away. <laughs> People who will say, mm, this is too hard. I'm not going to hear this. People who will turn and walk away. A falling away. You can't, you can't fall away from something that you've never been a part of. I can't fall off of this altar right here unless I get up on there and stand. A falling away. They once were here. Just as those disciples that followed Jesus until the going got tough. And they turned and followed Him no more. But there were some who had a divine revelation of who Christ was. Of Christ and His church. And they stuck. And they were able to stay. How important is your revelation today? Oh, it's very important. Satan knows his time is limited, short. And he's working hard every day to deceive everyone that he can. We're in the midst of a falling away. In this religious world, we compare with Caesarea Philippi. The religious world, if Christ took his church and showed it, this religious world to the church, it's the same as showing Caesarea Philippi out there. Why? Because they got their own ideas. They got their own opinions. They got their own little set of rules. They take what they want out of the Word of God and they throw the rest of it away. They even create their own Bibles and call it the Word of God. Huh? Pagan worship. There were some in that day that turned and walked away. Jesus said, will you also go away? It took a revelation. It took a divine revelation to stick with Christ in His church. I appreciate you this morning. I thank the Lord for His Word. <clears throat> it is powerful. And it is revealing. God is trying to save all who will be saved. But just as he asked his disciples that day, whom say ye that I am? You're going to be faced with some decisions. It will take a divine revelation to make the right decisions. God bless you this morning. Appreciate your prayers.